series, Brave, Courage to Build Bridges Instead of Walls. Last week, we talked about uh, immigration, which may be the most controversial issue in Arizona. Today, we're talking about wealth inequality. And we'll look at stats, and, and, and we're going to watch a, a video. And let me just first say that the economy is incredibly complex. I don't even begin to pretend that I understand the inner workings of the U.S. economy. There are lots of economists who wouldn't say that. And so we just want to start with a spirit of humbleness today and do our absolute best to honestly address this topic uh, and, and be sober-minded about it and, and, and be thinking people. And this series uh, is, uh, was provoked by the fact that there is so much division in our country right now. There are a lot of strong emotions about these issues, and that's fine. We understand that. We just want to acknowledge that you may hear things that you maybe even provoke an emotional reaction in you, and you may not agree with something I say. I absolutely expect that. I don't, I don't expect you to agree with everything I say. And as I've said before, I'm okay if you disagree with the pastor. Are you okay if you disagree with the pastor? Surprisingly, some people aren't, but we're talking about very emotionally charged subjects today. So I want to run through some stats about wealth inequality in America. Some of this may seem dry to some folks for a few minutes. I also want to say that maybe this isn't some statistical reality to you. Maybe this is something that you're feeling. Maybe you are, are feeling emotionally the strain of finances. Maybe, maybe you're feeling what we're going through as a country in the larger context. Maybe you're feeling that personally with financial stress. And I want to make sure that... Uh, we have, we create an opportunity here, as Kristen prayed, where you know that you can open your heart to God. And there are things, whether it's in worship here or, or during a sermon or whatever, you might totally tune me out. I don't know. And, and you might just have this, this prayerful conversation with God to where you could come in here and the Spirit of God can meet you where you are and give you hope no matter what kind of financial pressure you're facing. Does that sound good to everybody? Amen. To whatever, whatever it is you're, you're carrying in here, that you could have an encounter with God. Even if I'm, if, it's, if I'm not even talking about it. And God could do healing work in your life and give you hope. But, so we're going to talk about wealth inequality today. Uh, the reason that the, the United States is called the land of opportunity is because uh, we have what we call the American dream. And it means that somebody could be born in poor circumstances and they can work hard and they can be upwardly mobile. And they could, they could uh, grow up to be a leader in society. They could build wealth. They could buy a home. They, and they can experience opportunities that they couldn't experience in many other countries. But unfortunately, the Ameri while the American dream is still alive, it's becoming a little bit harder. More people are feeling it harder to recognize the American dream, and here's why. There's a place to keep notes in your worship folder if you'd like to do that. The average college debt of graduating seniors in 2012 was 29400 dollars, almost 30 grand. As of 2013, the average S&P 500 CEO was paid 331 times more than the average worker. That's according to Forbes. Uh, now to the middle class, the middle 60% of, er of earners' share of the national income fell from 53% in 1970 to 45% in 2012. That's also according to Forbes. What that means is the middle class in America is shrinking. The, the middle majority of Americans have less wealth now than they did in 1970. Up to 2007, the income of the top 1% in our society grew by 281% since 1979, while the income of the middle one-fifth of Americans has grown by only 25%. That's according to the Congressional Budget Office. Not very encouraging statistics, are they? Standard & Poor's just released a, a warning this past Tuesday, which is great timing for me, finding that the income inequality right now in America is actually slowing down our recovery after the Great Recession in 2008. Because wealth is so unequal right now in the United States, it's taking longer to recover. I want to share this quote from the study. Higher levels of income inequality increase political pressures, discouraging trade, investment, and hiring. And they cite the famous economist John Keynes. First showed that income inequality can lead affluent households, Americans included, to increase savings and decrease consumption, while those with less means increase consumer borrowing to, to sustain consumption until those options run out. 
When these imbalances can no longer be sustained, and here's the key, I think, of the quote, we see a boom-bust cycle such as the one that culminated in the Great Recession. When people just can't quite make ends meet, it, the economy becomes more volatile, and we're more likely to see the boom and bust cycle, and it's slowing down our recovery. They pose several solutions, including a more effective tax structure, spending in health and education, infrastructure, incentives for people most likely to spend. In April, Princeton University released a study that got a little bit of media attention, but not nearly enough. Princeton University, one of the top you know, Ivy League schools in the United States, released a study called Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens by Gillens and Page. They compared 1,800 laws that were put into effect by Congress between 1981 and 2002. They looked at those laws and then they looked at polling of the average American and the wealthy and business interests. I want to share with you what they found. According to this Princeton University study, they said the United States is no longer a democracy. They said, in effect, the United States is an oligarchy, which means ruled by the few. By a few wealthy elites and corporate interests, and the will of the American people is not being legislated by Congress. Instead, what's happening is the will of a few elite is what's being legislated by Congress. Another quote, the central point that emerges from our research is that economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on US government policy, while mass-based interest groups and average citizens have little or no independent influence. When a majority of citizens disagrees with economic elites and or with organized interests, the majority generally lose. Isn't that a hard-hitting quote? You know, we, and I'm a patriotic American, we have this, we have this sense that America is, is it. And any opportunity you, you want, you can, you can have here. And yes, I believe that's still true with hard work. At the same time, we're faced with evidence that says it's getting harder to attain the American dream. Now, everyone, I think, is aware, or I won't say everyone, most people, believe that wealth inequality is a problem. However, I think that most Americans don't know how unequal uh, wealth is in the United States. And a couple of years ago, a video producer got a hold of some statistics. Now, there may be some discussion about the statistics, but they're, they're, they're close at least. And he made a great video about wealth inequality in America. It's called Wealth Inequality in America. And I want to show you this video. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution, and 92% that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution, shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart, but the top 1% has more of the country's wealth then nine out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind blowing. But let's look at it another way because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are, 
teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So here's that ideal we asked everyone about, something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30% are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly 100 times that of the poorest Americans, and about 10 times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10% are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5% are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1%, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, eight out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. All right, so a video like that is hard hitting and you know, some people might say, what is it, envy then? Or are, you, are we jealous of the ultra-rich? Why, why are we talking about this? Well, a little bit more information. To get into the top 1%, you would be making $400,000 a year, which is a very nice living. The real inequality, however, takes place even within the 1%. It's not 
It's not actually off the charts until you get to the top one-tenth of 1%. One and that's an income of $10 million a year. And that's where most of the wealth in the United States is concentrated. So even folks, for, for example, a surgeon who may make a half million, or, you know, yeah, half million dollars a year, a surgeon's working really hard. A surgeon is earning that money. So we're not, we're, not, we're not attacking people, we're not mad at people. We're just saying that wealth is so concentrated, even in the top one-tenth of 1%, one that it's creating other problems for our society. And uh, this is a, another graph this, uh, from 1979. This shows the growth of the top 1% in wealth and everybody else uh, growing a little bit, uh, at least in this graph. And I wanna show you the next slide. This is wealth distribution according to ethnicity. In 2009, well, blue is 2005, red is 2009, so you have post-recession. Look at the difference between whites on the left, Hispanics in the middle, and blacks on the right. And so we're facing a situation where it's not just statistics, but as a pastor, I have conversations like this with people. I know somebody who spent almost all of his retirement because he needed a back surgery. And he, he couldn't afford insurance at the time. So he worked all his life, and then it's almost all wiped out because of back pain. I talked to a college student this week who is feeling stress because she's working and trying to pay her way through college. And she knows in the two years she has left that she's gonna incur between twenty dollars and $40,000 in debt. She knows that's coming. And she, it's just worrying her. She's just, she's, you know, full of anxiety because she's facing these kinds of problems. There are lots of young families here who are struggling to buy a home. We know here many people lost their homes. Dreams have been shattered right here in the Southeast Valley. There are marriages, I, I, I know personally, people whose marriages are still struggling. And it started in the recession. And, and those problems created stress in their marriage, and that led to one thing, and that led to another, and, and, and that they're still experiencing problems because it's just so hard to deal with the financial realities that we face today. So this is something that, it, that affects people. We haven't even talked about the poor. We haven't even talked about those who are really struggling to get by, and, and basic needs aren't even really being met. Yes, there are government programs, but those don't solve the underlying problem that Standard & Poor's pointed out. So, what does the Bible say about this? D does God care about wealth and poverty? Is that something that God is concerned with? Well, I want to look at some scriptures, and there are two words that occur over and over and over in uh, scripture, and again, there's a place to uh, write these down if you'd like to keep notes and remember these things. And the two words, they begin in Genesis and they end in Revelation. They run through the entire Bible. They're the words justice and righteousness. Justice and righteousness. And in Hebrew, it's actually one word. The two words in Hebrew are actually one word. It's the word tzedakah. You have to say the T and the S together. Tzedakah. Can you say that? Tzedakah. Tzedakah. Justice and righteousness. Now, the kind of uh, minor meaning is to give alms or to give aid, that you give to help people who are in need, but there's a bigger meaning of tzedakah. The rabbis said there's actually six levels of tzedakah, and, and the best level, the highest level is you organize society in a way that does what is right by everybody. That society is set up in a way that everybody gets a fair shot. No, it's not socialism that the guy said in the video. It's just, it's, it's a, a system, that, sure, that encourages work and progress, but, but the, the game's not rigged. Everybody at least has a shot at their dream. Tzedakah, it's, it's a wonderful word. When I was in college, we had uh, chapel services three times a week. And, and one time we had a, a speaker come through named Tony Campolo. Who knows who Tony Campolo is? If you've ever heard Tony Campolo speak, he's a really charismatic guy, he's funny, but he's also extremely intelligent. He's a professor emeritus of sociology at Eastern University. He's also a Baptist pastor. This is, a, this is an evangelical uh, Christian leader in the United States, and, and he came to, to speak at our college, and, and at that time, he was traveling frequently, and, and he, he tended to begin his speeches in the same way. And he kind of had this interesting delivery where he'd, he'd be like, 
I came to talk to you about three things today. He's like the Gilbert Gottfried of Christian speakers. Like, I came to talk to you about three things today. And he had his eyes closed and he just shake his hands like this. And, and here's how he started his speech. And this is a guy who's worked for social justice. He started programs and ministries that, that are, are all about bringing tzedakah into the United States and around the world. He's given his life to social justice issues, and he's helped many, many people. He said, I have three things I want to talk to you about today. He said, one, last night while you were sleeping, 30,000 children died of diseases or malnutrition around the world. He said, number two, most of you don't give a shit. This was a crowd of conservative evangelical people in suits and ties. Cinch that tie up nice and tight. You could, you could hear a pin drop in the room. All the air was sucked out of the room. Their, their faces turned red. Their heart rates went up. You know, you could just, you could feel the thoughts in people's heads. Tony, don't you know that Jesus came and lived and died on the cross and rose from the dead so you wouldn't say dirty words? You know, that's what it means to be righteous, Tony. Don't, don't you know that that's what God wants from us? We don't, we don't cuss or drink or chew and we don't date the girls who do and we, we, we live righteous lives. Tony, don't you, don't you know that's what it means to be righteous? You could just feel that in the air. What they're talking about is the personal gospel. And it's the idea that salvation, what God wants to do, is all about just me and Jesus, and he wants me to be pious and not say four-letter words, and so when I die, he'll take me to heaven. So the personal gospel is, the way it's often skewed in America, is Jesus wants to save me by taking me somewhere else at some other time, and that's what they believed righteousness meant. The gospel really seems to be something different than that. The full gospel, there's the personal gospel, sure. He's, he is our personal savior. But there's also the social gospel. The social gospel comes out of the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the social gospel is about Jesus saving us right here and right now. Well, Tony just let that pause hang over the congregation as long as possible, right before they rent their clothes and storm the stage. He said, in number three, most of you are more upset that I just said the word shit than you are that 30,000 children died last night. I don't even think he needed to continue the speech. The point was made. And I saw a lot of people who love God and they love the Bible cut to the heart because they realize that he's right. And in scripture, justice and righteousness means not just Jesus saving me, oh, I want Jesus to save me. The personal gospel is vital, but it's not the whole gospel. Justice and righteousness are about what God wants to do among us right here, right now. It's our third value. Following Jesus is as much about this world as the next. I just want to give you some References. The first occurrence of Tzedakah is in Genesis, the first book, Genesis 18, 18 through 19. It's part of God's promise to Abraham. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. It's been God's purpose from the beginning. By the way, do you know why we made the warning about taking your kids to children's church? You follow that? Okay. Next example, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 9. I'm just going to give you a few examples here. The queen of Sheba, uh, which could be modern Yemen and Ethiopia, visits King Solomon, king over Israel and Judah, and she says to Solomon, praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. And here's the important part, because the Lord's eternal love for Israel he has made you king to do what? Maintain justice and righteousness. In the ancient world, it was believed that, that kings and queens were put there by God. And, and now, in our country, we are a government by the people and for the people, correct? We are the government, and what's what it's supposed to be. We are the government in the United States. We're the kings and queens. So what is the purpose of government? Why do we vote? What should we care about? What is government really about? Well, what would First Kings say? To maintain justice and righteousness. The purpose of government is to maintain justice and righteousness. 
An another example, these aren't on the screen, I could just run through. Uh, justice and righteousness appear in the Bible almost a thousand times, just to give you an idea. Another example is Isaiah 1, 17, the prophet Isaiah God says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Those are social realities, helping people who are most vulnerable. You know, from uh, MLK's I Have a Dream speech, he quotes Amos 5, let justice, wish I could say it like him, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Those are all about social realities in that day, and the Hebrew prophets spoke out about justice and righteousness. The ancient rabbis proposed that there were three classes of people. We're talking about class today. Three classes of people, according to the ancient rabbis. I have them listed here. They said, first, there are the zadokim. Those are the righteous people who practice justice and righteousness. They, they, they do what's right by everybody. Then there are the benunim, the indifferent. Interesting. People who don't care enough to practice righteousness. Then there are the reshaim, the evildoers, people who actively oppose righteousness, people who rig the system to benefit themselves. Three classes of people. Now, the interesting thing is the ancient rabbi said at the final judgment, when God judges us all, there will only be two categories. That actually two of these categories are going to be folded into one. Guess which ones? God will count some as righteous, but the indifferent and the evildoers will be counted as the unrighteous. Because to be indifferent isn't being righteous. To not care, to say, well, I'm doing okay. That's not going to be enough to be considered righteous in God's final judgment. And that brings us to the last scripture. It's in Matthew it's the teaching of Jesus. It's the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7. And, and, and here's what Jesus says. He says, verse 15, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The words of Jesus. That's a hellish metaphor. Verse 20, thus by their fruit you will know them. The rabbis said that the indifferent and the unrighteous are like trees that don't bear fruit. And then we see the Lord Jesus pick up on that rabbinical teaching and say to those who either are indifferent or practice unrighteousness, they're like trees that don't bear fruit. And what do you call a tree that doesn't bear fruit? Firewood. It's, it's a metaphor from Jesus. Now, we've, I've preached sermons about hell before, and we've, we've had discussions about that, and there are lots of questions about that, but you see the seriousness of Jesus' statement here. For those of us who might be tempted to say, well, you know, I'm doing okay. And we might be in category number two, the indifferent. Well, there aren't going to be three categories. Jesus says you have the righteous and the unrighteous. Those who do not bear fruit of righteousness, those who don't do what is right by everybody, there will be consequences for them. It's, it's a sobering reminder, isn't it? So for those of us who want to follow Jesus, just quickly want to wrap up with three things we can do. Ways to live out justice and righteousness. Well, the first is to give. And we live in a culture where many people spend more than they earn. They don't save enough. Don't, they don't even have things that they could have that, that, are, that are nice because they spend money on instant gratification instead of saving for nice things. So even selfishly, we live in a culture where lots of people don't have the nice things they could have because they spend their money too quickly. That's just the kind of culture we live in. Well, in a culture like this, we can decide to live generously and give of ourselves. We have a ministry here called One for One. It's one, one dollar for one person. And what it means is every single week, for every person, adult and child, who comes in to a one church worship service, we set aside one dollar. And that goes into a fund, and once a quarter, we give that amount to a local nonprofit who is making our community a better place. And we're actually past due, and moving to Perry, and th that uh, work we lost uh, track of our of our uh, our timetable for donations, and we actually owe, owe two 
one for one donations now. And the first one, the second one we're going to give in a few weeks, but the first one we're going to give today. And we're going to give a donation to Matthew's Crossing. This is a food bank in North Chandler. And uh, Matthew's Crossing was started in 2001. They served, listen to this, uh, they served over 43,000 clients in 2013. 43,000 people. 17,749 were children. And they gave out 12,773 boxes of food. On their site, they, they uh, say that 25% of the children in Arizona are under-resourced. One in seven seniors struggle to meet their food needs. And right now they're creating a new program designed to break the cycle of poverty, not just giving out food boxes, but actually training people to get out of the cycle of poverty. Uh, new programs will include nutrition classes, resume writing workshops, free flu shots, immunizations, wellness seminars, workplace readiness, diabetes education, CPR classes, and more. And so the, the donation that we're gonna mail to them this week is coming from you as a congregation. It's based on our attendance in the first quarter of the year. So you, the people of One Church, are going to give to Matthew's Crossing $1,530. Isn't that pretty cool? Is that something to celebrate? That came from you. So one way that we can live justice and righteousness is by giving. Well, the second way, uh, because of the stats that you've seen here, you may not be surprised to see this, is, well, through government. The truth is, and like I said, I'm not going to tell people how to vote, but the truth is we're not going to solve this problem of wealth inequality in America by writing $1,500 checks to food pantries. That's a Band-Aid. What we just did there is great, but it's relieving misery in Jesus' name. It's not addressing the root cause. I heard, I heard a speaker one time named Jim Wallace say that you know, lots of Christians are committed to helping people in the sense of, let's say he used a metaphor like this, you have people who are drowning in a river. And, and so people of compassion rush up to the riverbank and, and throw out lines and jump in, and, and they pull people out of the river. He said lots of Christians will, will pull people out of the river. They'll give a donation to a food pantry. They'll, they'll do something like that, and they'll pull people out of the river. But he said, how long do we pull people out of the river before we start asking, why are people falling into the river? And go upstream and figure out what it is systemically. What is the bigger picture here that's causing people to fall into the river? What's going on? If we address that root cause, then we won't have to pull people out of the river anymore because we've addressed the real issue. Well, the famous political scientist Harold Laswell defines politics as who gets what, when, and how. That's what politics is, according to Laswell. Well, if that's the case, then justice and righteousness should be involved. Would you agree? Do you think justice and righteousness should be involved in that process of who gets what, when, and how? Campolo says it this way, social justice is the primary purpose of government. So one of the ways that we can do justice and righteousness in our society is in the voting booth. It's just, that's what needs to be on our minds when we go into the, vote, the voting booth. Third, you can gain financial peace in your own life. A third way to live out justice and righteousness is to gain your own financial peace. We actually have a Financial Peace University class going right now. It's full, they're about halfway through. We'll have more in the future. If you're really struggling with your finances, and Hannah and I have taught financial peace before too, we'll have more classes. You could email me, ryan.gear at onechurch.com, and we can, we can put you on a list and make sure we get you into a future financial peace class and you can get out of debt, learn how to budget, build wealth, and, and, and be done with the stress of all that. And like I said, it's not just that the average America, uh, American is, is stingy or doesn't want to give. A lot of people want to give, but they can't because they've spent their money in other ways. And now there are people who are unemployed and they can't afford to be generous. Or, you know, we need to help them. But there are lots of people who you know, have employment, but they don't live a generous life because they've spent their money other ways. Well, a class like Financial Peace University could help with that. John Wesley, if you're taking notes, this is a great quote. John Leslie, uh, Wesley, a spiritual leader in the 1700s, said this about money. Make all you can through honest means. Make all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. You're not going to go wrong following that guideline. If you want to follow Jesus and justice and righteousness and even in your finances, make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And finally, we want to gain financial peace so that we can be rich in good deeds. 
1 Timothy 6, says, Godliness with contentment is a great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Command those who are rich in this present world. And riches is relative, right? Compared to Nicaragua or compared to other places in the United States. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life.